Section One of Tales of the Uneasy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert. Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. The Telegram, Part One. Her mother was dead. Her life stood altered. She would be no poorer, it was not that. She was an orphan, and all her mother had had came to her. That meant seventy thousand pounds, plate, linen, and the freehold of a fine old house in Lower Seymour Street, that they had moved into a year before the old lady died. Things were no more altered socially than they were altered pecuniarily, for the Damers' set naturally corresponded, as sets do, with their postal district, and Miss Alice Damer could therefore continue to command an entrance into the best circles. Only she realized that she must henceforth enjoy all these good things to the tune of a paid companion, having no poor and amenable relations handy, whom she could draft into the household economy, and afterwards snub into a colourless bare existence. She was thirty-five, and her years did not weigh on her except mentally. The first faint physical signs of the debacle were, so far, evident to herself alone, and then only in moods of unusual depression. She was still young enough to need a companion. Her pretty red-gold hair was as red as gold, as pretty as ever, her visits to her dentists as few, her eyes as deep, and her step as elastic. Although she had given up dancing— she had made this sacrifice more from a sense of fitness, as a concession to the needs of the young girls coming up round her, and who deserve their turn on the floor, than of social necessity. As a matter of fact, she had never been really fond of that over-energetic, disordering form of amusement. She loved the world and going up and down in it immensely, and her way of enjoying parties was to sit out if it was a dance, away from the music if it was a concert, and in the back of the box if it was a play. She was a flirt. Not an outrageous, noisy, ill-bred flirt, but what is known as a quiet flirt, with many strong and efficient strings to her bow. Did one of them, being after all only catgut or mere man, snap occasionally, that is to say, get married out of the circle of her charm, Alice, in her quiet way, promptly renewed the string and supplied herself with a new admirer, as good at fetching and carrying as the old. In her mind that was the chief use of admirers, to prevent one's looking neglected. Of course one never really was. She was a woman of many affairs. She liked living not exactly in hot water, but in water at least warm, and was seldom seen talking to women though she was quite nice to them, as intrusive but law-permitted aliens in the Pays du Cour. None of her friends would have dared to ask her to a lady's lunch or any overwomaned party. A man had always to be got for Alice, else she would have been hurt, and quite unable to play her part properly. She was unused to, unversed in her own sex. On the other hand, she played fair, and never took other women's men, or encouraged their husbands to play the pretty game with her. People said that for her, that she never made women unhappy, only men. She was never very sorry for a man's love troubles, for she had a theory that a hopeless passion or two did a man no harm, and that the more he proposed, the merrier, for him. She never told anyone how many offers she had refused, men often did propose to her and she refused them all and boasted that she had never been engaged for even an hour and that no man had ever kissed her the bloom was not off alice unless so much mental coming and going in her courts had produced some such subtle effect why should i marry she used to say to everard jenkins good old welsh family when he importuned her to relax her rule in his favour, and even go so far as to making the vast experiment of marriage with him as her partner. There is no earthly hurry. No, but perhaps a heavenly one, he had inanely replied. 
I may never marry at all. Girls, economically, don't need to marry as they used to, and at any rate I am independent so far as money goes. So the way is clear for you to marry for love. I don't think I shall ever fall in love. Then take a man you like, and you like me. Everard was not at that time sufficiently far gone in love to make him inattentive to and unappreciative of the use and value of cheek in discussing such matters with his princess. Yes, I like you, but as you know, I don't love you, and I'm so made that I must be quite sure in my own mind that I am absolutely, positively incapable of loving madly before I let myself go with any one, even you. Don't you see, in the interests of morality, one must be sure of oneself, or there might be catastrophe, with a strong nature like mine? No, said Everard, patiently and earnestly. There would, I am sure, be no danger of that with you. Your husband might feel perfectly safe in your hands. Thanks. Why do you say that? Because the power to flirt never implies the power to love, I am afraid. "'Well, Everard, you can't say that I flirt with you,' she exclaimed noisily. "'Oh, no, your knowing that I am desperately, dully serious about you protects me a little. And you do pay me the doubtful compliment of taking no trouble to attract me. You honestly never put your best foot foremost with me, or pose like a heroine to your most humble valet.' "'Yes,' Alice agreed, laughing a little bitterly. I promise you never to encourage you in any way. I would let you see me with my hair in curlers if I wore them, anything to convince you of the purity of my intentions. I simply will not have you say that I lead you on or encourage you. My God, Alice, I don't say it. I know well enough I am a damned fool and have nothing whatever to go on. A fool to love me? A fool because I am a lonely man and I don't like being a lonely man, and yet this feeling of mine towards you will keep me so, so far as I can see. I don't suppose I shall ever marry. I know I shan't. That's what you've done, Alice, and I may just as well go ahead and make my will in your favour, for I shall never have any wife or child to leave my money to. I feel that it will be so. Really, my poor Everard! She tried very hard not to look flattered. This is most sad. I couldn't have believed there was such fidelity left in this wicked world. And to tell you the truth, I don't believe it possible even now. I'm really not vain enough, if I am cruel. Not so very vain, and not a bit cruel. I honestly believe if you thought you could get up any sort of feeling for me, you'd say so. You never will say it to me, but to someone else, I suppose. You are human, like everyone else. It's all rot about not being capable of love. Every woman is, or is able to think she is, and that's enough in a great many cases. Oh, you'll find the man sooner or later, and I, well, I shall wish you every happiness, and be godfather to the kids. Nice little flirts, kids, with pretty hair like yours. Now I'd better go away to the temple and make that will, as I've quite made up my mind to die a bachelor." "'Nonsense,' said Alice sharply, more touched than she liked to own. "'I won't even be friends with you if you go on like that. Leave things open. Not for me, of course. It must be quite understood that I don't accept any such sacrifice of your life as waiting for me would entail. Believe me, I know myself, and I know, somehow, deep down, that I shall never fall in love with you. That being the case, don't you think I should be really behaving rather badly?' If I allowed you to think that you could ever melt me by faithful service and little things like that? All right, beggars don't choose. You shall have the faithful service all the same, and it shall not hope to melt you. Will that suit you? We'll leave it at that, then, said Alice, permitting the young and promising barrister to kiss her hand, and devote his wits and energies and the rest of his life to her use. She could always find work for him. He did it all as he had said. He was thus able to be about the house. That was his retaining fee. 
whether it was painful to him or not in his present state of mind to see so much of alice damer it was a fact that he did have to meet her continually she sent little business-like notes round to his chambers nearly every day short sensible not encouraging notes he made all the arrangements for their journeys and their parties and their entertaining of their friends he saw her mother and herself off to the continent every year when they went to do their cure was attentive at the carriage door bought the railway literature and pumped up the air cushions he could always be counted upon to be odd man at a dinner party and if it was humanly possible and sometimes when it was inhumanly impossible threw over any other important engagement that he may have had important to himself be it understood his clerk thought he led a dog's life. What Everard thought was never recorded. What Alice thought was simply this, that Everard liked doing little things for her, and was by temperament a born bachelor, although he still cultivated that touching delusion that he was lonely and wanted a companion. It was only that he wanted her, and seeing her this way, every day, off and on, was really the pablum his soul cried for other and more full-blooded men would not have been content with so merely spiritual a sustenance at any rate he never showed any tendency to stray from the portal and outer courts of this austere temple of respectful worship alice had no cause for jealousy her victim never twisted or wriggled on the hook of her attraction his ready smile on seeing her flourished as ever only there was more drawing in it as expressed by the hatchet lines in his mouth in short everard grew thin his chest was rather narrow he coughed often and tiresomely lung symptoms seemed to be developing themselves there alice out of gracious regard for him had suggested his accompanying her mother and herself to the riviera one winter instead of seeing them off and falling back into the fog of charing cross as usual he had refused on the score of his pressing work promising however to wear a respirator on the very bad days it was a pity he had not gone with them that time for all that she was a flirt and men were her material alice didn't know them at all she met a man out at cap martin a man everard would have seen through at a glance this common adventurer made love to her he managed to engage the poor flirt's affections there was nothing in it no magnetism he was a better flirt than she that was all and while alice had money he had none she returned and confided her woes everard had his work cut out for him he interviewed this handsome predatory person and succeeded in retrieving alice's letters for her it was a supreme bit of service and alice was truly grateful to him the wretch went out of her life leaving her in a rather deplorable condition of nerves and mind and everard threw himself into the situation as no man who is not deeply attached to a woman unpicturesquely love-sick for another could have done he visited her every day and comforted and consoled her by allowing her to talk about it all alice's grief furnished the theme for many a dreary summer's afternoon when everard used to take her up the river to distract her mind it was a trip she had always firmly refused to take with him in the old days on the score of propriety an excuse that masked dread of boredom boredom was not in it now it was acute tragedy poor alice forgot all propriety when once she was towed well out into the midstream there she gave way and allowed the echoes of datchet and lalaham to echo with her sobs for she had been awfully hard hit once indeed everett remembered but with no pleasure sense of a lover's guerdon gained she had leaned forward in the boat with the abandon of despair and kissed her patient confidant it was the only woman's kiss everard had ever received in his life and it had tasted of salt tears still it was a love symbol and the nearest alice could do in the line he wished or had wished for perhaps he did not now desire her quite so urgently as he had done 
Everard had never been handsome at the best of times, but that summer season rang the final knell of his good looks. His crow's feet and his cheek and jaw lines were awful. Alice herself noticed them. "'I believe it is you, Everard, who are going to break down now,' she said to him once when it was all over, her misbegotten love buried fathoms deep, and she cared to look round her a little and notice what other people were doing. The very violence of her passion had perhaps caused the flame to burn itself out in this young lady of the world, this parlour warrior, this heroine of a hundred ballroom fights. At any rate, her emotional crisis passed away, leaving her, who was already hard, a little harder than before, to Everard's business precautions and his adroit playing of animated safety valve to the deserted one. Alice, luckily for her, had not needed to confide in a member of her own sex. Her zest for the noble game of flirtation had died down, too. She was less interested in men, and rather more interested in herself than she had been, and condescended to enjoy a party, even if she came away from it without the tendrils of a heart of sorts reaching after her. Her superficial bloom returned. She had never lost, only temporarily mislaid it. She was a fundamentally good-looking woman, with neat, regular features, a good figure, and perfect constitution to fall back on. To Everard's satisfaction she now proved the validity of these fine assets of beauty. But she had spoken a true word in jest. Everard Jenkins went and had a bout of brain fever. He was popularly supposed to have broken down from overwork. Alice Damer and her mother were most kind and solicitous, and as fussy about him as they could be without setting the public tongue a-wagging. Alice now worshipped on the altar of convention again, and would not have been seen up the river with Everard, or near his rooms in paper buildings for anything. Her mother was old and unwieldy, so they wrote. They were quite careful, but as it was, old friends opined that Miss Damer was going to settle down and take up with her old and tried suitor. When taxed with this by the ill-bred privileged, she maintained boldly that there was nothing in it, that she and Mr. Jenkins thoroughly understood each other. So they did. Everard was grateful without any expectation of favours to come, and thanked her prettily for grapes and books and things. He recovered, and went about his own business as usual. Alice's business was not pressing just now, so the two rather lost sight of each other, Alice holding him in reserve for future extremity. She supposed, sometimes aloud, that he was busy getting on, and making up for the lost time in his illness. There could be no woman in it. "'Rather a wreck, poor old Jenks,' his friends observed with affection, for he was a general favourite with men, and most unfairly persisted in attributing his state not to the illness he had undergone, but to Alice Damer's vast and loose playing. She heard this, but tossed her head, confident in the good understanding that persisted between her and her slave. "'I have never encouraged Everard. He knows I haven't,' she declared to her mother. "'He says so. I think you have been quite horrid to him, Alice,' was the old lady's single solitary pronouncement on the situation. She said this lying on her bed during what was to prove her last illness. Alice was gentle and kind, but repressed all sentimental leanings on the part of the invalid, who had a mother's natural wish to see a vagrant-hearted daughter settled in love and marriage before she died. Mother, how often must I tell you that Everard, Mr. Jenkins, and I understand each other? She repeated coldly. She had never chosen to call Everard by his Christian name, though her mother, who was fond of him, always insisted on doing so. And Everard obviously liked it, and clung to this side entry into the intimacy of Alice's family. It did not matter. Alice and he, as before said, understood each other, 
and old ladies everyone knows have a way of attaching themselves to young men and selecting their daughters suitors for them by the light of their own predilections and now her dear silly old mother was dead and buried and the proud sensible daughter sat all alone in the big seymour street drawing-room with the three large windows that needed so much stuff for their curtains and the beautiful adam's mantelpiece whose shelf alice could hardly see over the damers had only been in the house a year it was freehold and alice's it was rather a large and dreary abode for one young woman to inhabit permanently yet the young woman thought she meant to do so a companion she sadly supposed in that case must be procured sooner or later later preferably if she could have her way not at all alice was nearly forty though she looked younger why should she not use her age for all it was worth and establish herself on the easy footing of years of discretion nay there would be complications there her womanly instincts rebelled against the aspersion of discretion and the constant assertion of her maturity which would be involved in her adoption of that attitude she would be asked to play chaperone herself she would have to dress old no she looked so young for her age it would be ridiculous when she could as easily carry the other theory through and pose as a breakable compromisable commodity she must make up her mind to accept the duenna she must get in a woman to quarrel with it came very hard she had been used to going about alone and receiving guests by herself in this house for the last year mrs damer had been unable to dine down or preside at her own table she had appeared beautifully capped and lappeted to set the seal of chaperonage for a few minutes before dinner and then prettily said good-night to her young guests when dinner was announced alice was quite equal to it and always invited another woman preferably married to her charming dinners a companion would by the conditions of her office take part in every function quiet dinners as well as noisy ones it would be far worse than a husband for a husband would at least leave the tea-hour free all alice's serious tete-a-tetes had been used to come off then in the little room off the stairs that was really part of the hall and in no way shut off but so delightfully private little soft rosy cosy late teas had been alice's great social weapon all the more fetching were these free and easy interviews in that she wasn't in the least like an american though she did see young men alone with a mother stowed away somewhere in the upper fastnesses of the house this problem of the companion was associated with the first glimmering in alice damer's mind of the possibility of a husband's suiting at this juncture the notion of a companion precipitated him he came in by the door of convenience a husband well who was it wanted to marry her at that moment men's names long shelved came into her mind but not everard's like the poor she had him always with her he was always available but the others unaccountably enough did not rush into the arena of her requirements at once she must be growing old did people think her old she had not noticed that they did she could see no sign of the coming of crow's feet of which this backward turn of bow's feet was supposed to be ominous for surely a year ago plenty of potential husbands lay ready to her hand the signs of age if there were any signs were on the outside alice internally felt as fit as ever she was still game for anything in the way of social folly she could sit up as late as any one and dozed off happily the moment she got home and her head touched the pillow she did not have to read in bed or play patiences to induce sleep her figure showed no fatal early inclination to spread she didn't know what it was to sit over a fire and she proudly refused to avoid lobster salad or anything else indigestible at supper 
unless indeed the craving for marriage itself was a sign of age a subtle token of the need for support the birth of an instinct for clinging she rose and looked at herself in the old unbecoming empire mirror that everard had got for her at a sale at christie's once for he was a connoisseur no very few lines no look of fatigue even in a bad glass and as much colour in her hair that poor everard admired so as ever there was poor dear everard no not poor dear everard he had been growing rather slack lately and forgot her flowers and fish and game now and then he had been kind of course and considerate over her mother's death had continually called to inquire though the presence of authorized relations in the house had rendered his visits nugatory as far as she was concerned alice was formal about death she had seen much of it still she had liked to see his card in the hall though unable to ask him to come in because of aunts polly and gertrude it had been an awful unmentionable time that sort of life that everybody must lead at times when death is in the house and now it was over and the aunts had gone home making her promise to give them a month at taunton next week when she had got things a little straight and done seeing lawyers and that was over too her nerves that had been a little upset though she had expected her mother's death had righted themselves too she cried about her mother every day but only once in the day and she began to think she would like to see someone who wasn't family why should she not begin with everard when the companion had come or the husband she would have very little opportunity for tete-a-tetes with him unless he was the husband well we should see she settled that it was to be to-morrow a quite impromptu invitation if it were ceremonious she could not have him alone and she wanted him alone she set about ordering a nice little dinner for him consonant with his tastes which unluckily she did not know everard had dined in seymour street before but only on big formal occasions never alone so far as she remembered everard replied in fairly good time he did not say he was previously engaged for he knew that she would never forgive him for not throwing the other people for her but ill at least not ill but with a very bad cold as the dinner she said was quite informal might he ask her to postpone it a day or two until he had a little got the better of his cough which would make him a rather tiresome guest apart from the danger of chill to which he found himself more liable than formerly he would like to suggest saturday night his birthday what a funny old maidish letter was alice's comment all about his cold and that i never knew everard notice a cold before i suppose a man gets finicky living so much alone he's no exception to the rule i'll have to wake him up a little his cool deferring of her invitation afforded him just that touch of masterful self-assertiveness everard had always lacked in his dealings with this young woman she now firmly made up her mind to marry him that is if he continued to carry things off so well he would be better than a companion and there seemed to be nobody else end of section one Section two of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Telegram, Part two. At a quarter to eight on Saturday evening, she was all ready, dressed in black and looking very handsome on one side of the brightly burning fire, for there was a slight touch of frost in the air. Her senses were alert she found herself actually listening for the sound of his hansom driving up to the door quite lover-like she thought with a little laugh to herself she remembered the last sentence in everard's old maidish letter which she passed over on first reading he had informed her that this was his birthday she welcomed this as a touch of sentiment the sentiment she had not in the old days been solicitous to cultivate in him but had carelessly let die she wished she could remember exactly how old he was to-day if she had been able to allude to it it would have pleased him 
No use. She could not recapture the knowledge. She supposed he might be somewhere about forty. And he was late. How dared he be late for her? Was there a fog, perhaps? She went to the window, parted the heavy curtains, and looked out. Rather misty, but not enough to prevent Everard from keeping time. If he had started early enough to dress, how rude if he hadn't! She remained drumming on the pane with her long, slender fingers, looking down into the empty roadway. She had not heard the door of the drawing-room open, but suddenly, before she had time to turn away from the window, Everard stood beside her with his handkerchief held up to his face, a familiar gesture of his for which she had often reproved him. "'How are you?' she asked him, rather frigidly. "'What a draught you seem to have brought in with you.' "'May I shut the door?' Everard said, suiting his action to the words. "'Come to the fire, won't you? You are cold.' She spoke more cordially, but in spite of her definite intentions to propose herself to Everard that evening, the curious sense of physical alienation, which she knew now had held them apart all these years, returned to her with tenfold vigour. Her instinct had been right. Physical leanings counted for something, and there was no real affinity between them. Alice shivered a little, for she was a sensible, business-like woman, and she firmly meant to override the absurd and awkward shrinking and marry him. Her mind once made up, she never went back. He was holding his thin, blue-veined hands to the blaze. His eyes seemed to avoid hers. "'Yes, that's right,' she said. "'I hope you have got a good appetite. I have ordered such a nice little dinner for you.' "'How kind of you! But really, I eat very little except fish.' My doctor has cut me down remorselessly. And do you attend to him? You never used. I have to attend to his orders. I am in rather a bad way, Alice. The base of one lung is quite solid, and the other is gone. Nonsense! I believe you're as right as I am, barring this little bit of a cold, that you'll soon get rid of. You haven't coughed once since you were in the room, do you know? I fancy that living alone as you do. You go and get ideas about yourself, and then rush out and call in a doctor who frightens you. Maybe, he said slowly, loneliness certainly doesn't improve one's perspective, and I haven't been inside anyone else's house for a month. There, now, what did I say? And what do you do when you are at home? Sit over the fire and grizzle and think of your sins and mine, eh? Not yours much, said he with a chilling effect of partial forgiveness which benumbed Alice, whose fighting spirit was up in arms to bring him to her feet again. The maid announced dinner, and Alice took his recalcitrant arm, which gave her the sense of being glued to his side. On the way downstairs she thought, Poor dear, he will want civilizing all over again. You'll drink champagne, she suggested, when they were both seated. No water, please he added, speaking to the maid. Thanks, no soup. He allowed a helping of fish to be placed on his plate, but he did not eat a mouthful that Alice could see. The dreary dinner progressed. Alice Damer ate for two, and every now and then looked furtively at the man she had made. It was her fault. She saw it now. This man had been her slave. She had been his inhuman master. She had laid him on the rack, she had starved his heart. For bread she had given him a stone. This was what their famous understanding had amounted to, the ruin of a man, a pale, thin, hectic mask, sitting opposite her, pretending to eat. The play of his thin wrists that manipulated his knife and fork drove her frantic, his sullen eyes refusing to meet hers, as in tones that only faintly represented the rich, soft legal measured voice she used to know he responded gently but dully to all her conventional openings and allowed the subjects she started so painstakingly to drop one by one what would the servants think little pearly drops of dismay and effort broke out on her own white forehead the effort she was making was too much for even her social fortitude yes she knew she had behaved badly to him but he might let her down more easily. Vexing of him! 
for what she had to do must be done in spite of difficulties. The last course had been removed. Two punctilious, slightly shocked maids had disappeared, and the couple were left alone over the walnuts and the wine. She spoke to him quite crossly, in a voice she could hardly command. "'Aren't you interested in anything, Everard?' "'Yes, dear, in some things. For instance, in your calling me by my Christian name, for the first time,' he replied quietly. Alice felt uncomfortable. Such a direct thrust from this petrifaction suggested that he had seen through her, who hardly realized herself and what she was doing. "'Oughtn't I? I forgot.' "'Oh, don't apologize. It doesn't matter. I wanted you to badly once, do you remember? Strange, when it does come, one is more or less past caring. "'Coffee? I make it myself now, as you see.' "'Yes, please.' She made it. She handed it. She even let her fingers graze his as she passed him the cup. It was literally the first time she had ever practised her own special art of flirtation in Everard's connection. Then there fell a silence between them. The patent coffee machine ceased to bubble. Its duties were sped. Alice, sipping a restorative draught of the tonic liquid, broke the silence bravely. She felt that she owed it to him to take the initiative. "'I am feeling very lonely now,' she said softly. "'Poor child, you must be,' he answered gravely. "'And I think I—I I understand a little better how you must have felt all these years.' He lifted his fishy eyes for the first time to hers. "'Yes, but I am used to it now.' "'But, Everard, it hasn't done you any good.' "'No, I dare say not.' "'Everard, do you think—now, do you believe we—you and I, I mean, would have got on together?' How do you mean? In what relation? I mean, in the usual relation, if I had wanted what you wanted. Well, you know, I thought so then. Not now? No, not now. Did I not tell you that I had grown philosophical? Whatever is, is good. Oh, dear, then you tell me that you think it is good you are living alone, with not a soul to talk to or exchange an idea with. "'No one to look after you when you are ill, as you are now, "'but just to sit mooning over a dying fire.' "'The ghost of a shrug was vouchsafed her. "'Oh, I keep my fire up, and I mix my own grog and drink it, "'and warm my own slippers. It isn't so bad.' "'Everard!' she rose to her feet, and he imitated her, "'supposing that a move to the drawing-room was contemplated. "'No, I am not going up yet.' not till we have had this out you do make it very difficult for me it is as if you had lost the key you will not understand a demimo why should it be a demimo he repeated after her catching however none of her fire he sat down again and motioned her to do the same then he spoke dully but very clearly let us talk quietly and not get excited over it a man in my condition has no time for vagueness. I do understand quite well, and I will show you that I do. You are willing to marry me now? Yes, she cried breathlessly. Yes, poor Everard. And you, you don't want me to any more? I want nothing. I don't think of me. Let us consider only you. Now tell me, would this marriage be of any use to you? used to me to be married to you everard she started sorry but i can only put it from the point of view of utility my personal desires are dead ah oh, i killed them yes my dear you killed them i can't pretend to any extravagant feelings of joy at what i suppose we must call your capitulation you know they give better terms to beleaguered fortresses the sooner they surrender you alice in your pride and impregnability left it too long the wine got musty in the bottle and the cord got frayed and rotten i am no good to you or anybody my life is done i thought all this out as i lay there wrote some of it down even i never thought i should get a chance of telling it all to you in person i could not rest in my delirium 
delirium oh everard what nonsense he put her exclamations aside well i have told it you now and i shall rest in peace if it's any consolation to you you have had a good scold a good go at me alice cried angrily adding with bitterness and plus the satisfaction of refusing me but not at all he said turning surprised lack-lustre eyes on her if you think a marriage with me would do you any earthly good you shall have it i ought to have made that clear i wanted to do good to you she wailed too late for that i won't pretend even to salve your conscience alice that i care anything at all about it besides your conscience has no need of salving you were perfectly right not to marry me in your heyday and mine if you could not love me you are very kind and perfectly in order to suggest it now as a way of making me useful to you as you have done in the past i am at your service now as ever i am reserved to your use as good as married to you already though not you to me and quite ready to go to church with you to-morrow if you decide that we shall do so i am your property only my dear it is a pity you tied me up in brown paper and left me on the shelf so long fatal delay unused i deteriorated you have had me warehoused so many years that now when you choose to untie me and take me down you find that you will have to make allowance for depreciation of stock i think i wrote that to you or said it how it did amuse mrs clarkson who's mrs clarkson she asked through her tears he did not answer but rose and took her in his arms pale flickers of posthumous triumph lighted up his kind lined face weakly victorious he enfolded her and she shrunk and shivered out of his embrace what is it dear nothing oh nothing only i don't believe i can marry you everard after all he did not ask her why and she could hardly have told him that the momentary contact had affirmed the sense of physical aversion she had always thought she felt for him now she was sure oh what was she to do she stood timorously away from him as it were freed from the clasp of a corpse how could she tell him that and then she reflected consolingly that according to his own words marriage meant so little to him now that she need perhaps never kiss him when they were married her colour returned a little as she formulated this evasion many a conscientious woman has forced herself before now to marry a wreck to pay conscience money there was a good fire burning she motioned him to one of two leather-covered chairs drawn up on opposite sides of the fireplace it's warm here we won't go upstairs i'm really getting rather frightened about you everard i was incredulous at first but i do believe now that you have been ill yes i have been very ill but why come out why didn't you send an excuse ask me to come to you would you have come well as a matter of fact a telegram was sent you mrs clarkson said she had sent it mrs clarkson your landlady your bedmaker oh dear how unkind you must have thought me no i don't know that i thought anything about it i said she might send it and then it passed out of my mind entirely everything did go clean out all at once somehow it's a most unusual sensation very like death i should think everard i believe you ought to be in bed now you ought not to be here pleasant as it is go home and i'll come and nurse you to-morrow i can safely do that i am engaged to you she spoke with mouth awry putting the greatest constraint upon herself he smiled awfully kind of you dear but i've got a nurse already mrs clarkson is a nurse everard you're dreaming do you mean a white-capped creature with starched cuffs how could you be here if that were so i don't know but i am here you see mrs clarkson certainly did send you a wire to say i couldn't come she asked you to come to me i believe though i forbade her as i told you he sighed i forgot it all 
but then why have you come and why haven't i got the wire wrongly addressed i fancy i was too ill to speak much she looked the address up in my book and i have only your old one there it shows how i've neglected you but it's as well you didn't come the nurse is excellent these hired people do best because they have no feelings whether it's merely putting on a poultice or finally laying you out oh don't everard he rose he looked preoccupied it's after midnight do you realize how late we have been talking right into the night the daylight will surprise us in a minute oh dear me i must be off he rose and stood wavering like a wind-blown taper good night dear alice i shan't forget you have kissed me once in your life oh no twice once on the river that day the twelfth of july i loved you i wish you had loved me too i did i do she averred her lips chattering too late said he taking a woollen comforter out of his pocket everard i don't think you are fit to go home alone let me send someone with you or or stay here the servants are not gone to bed and there's a spare room slept in only last night and polly and your reputation i'll risk that she said i've behaved too badly to you not to make you some amends but it's all nonsense i am all right strength has been given me how funnily you talk well since you will be foolhardy and go back to your nurse is she pretty you know i don't believe in her you are thinking of your landlady who's been mothering you a little as she should she put out her hand and rang the bell a hansom please for mr jenkins you shouldn't have done that he said i meant to walk well you aren't going to be allowed to walk you must take no risk have a good night's rest and be well enough to marry me to-morrow by special license she looked up in his face with terror-stricken audacity how could she do it would you really he was out in the hall by now and the maid was whistling for a cab well we'll see i'll come to you at eleven in paper buildings i know the way i've been there once dear alice how unmaidenly you are grown all of a sudden i like it though it is some compensation but will you really marry me if i come if i can he answered gravely the hansom had come rattling up she gave a twist to the comforter keep it well over your mouth i will kiss your hand first she controlled herself his touch was pain to her she wailed as the hall door closed oh i don't love him he is dead i have killed him i'll marry him that is my vow the strayed telegram was brought her next morning on the tray with her tea it had been as everard had surmised wrongly addressed to the old house it ran mr jenkins unable to go to you to-night ill come if prefer she must have been in a rare fright when she wrote that whoever she is thought alice who could not bring herself to believe in the presence of a nurse in eighty-two paper buildings her exultation of last night had left her everard was such a wreck poor dear every bit of charm and he never had much had departed and left him sere dry stupid and unsympathetic but she meant to marry him and repair her sins and be able to live without a companion even an invalid husband was better than a hired salacium she would go and see him this morning but of course they could not really be married at once out of hand like that in a week or so after a few preparations had been made and when he had been nursed up and made to look a little less ghastly she could not allow a ghost to lead her to the altar then they would go off somewhere warm for the honeymoon to the riviera or egypt and everard would revive under the combined influences of sun and agreeable society and love that is if he was still capable of feeling the kindly glow of a delayed but at last gratified passion 
perhaps he was not quite so dead after all perhaps in time she would find herself able to submit to his kisses without a politely suppressed shudder though she could easily account for that symptom of hers starved physically and mentally as he seemed to be what wonder that all the magnetism had gone from him Alice, none other, would nurse him back to life, make a charming, attentive, affectionate husband of him, one whose kisses she would get not to mind so much. She drove down to the temple and dismissed her carriage at the gate on the embankment and walked up. Quite unnecessarily, for Everard's rooms in paper buildings had a road in front where a carriage might stand. But she did not mind walking. It was a lovely morning. The famous fountain in the court was playing merrily, and suggested springing hopes of all sorts, and possibilities of revival. She walked along to Everard's rooms with a light step, laughing a little to herself at the thought that she was going to earn for him the reputation of being a dog. She did not suppose many young ladies sought out the dry student lawyer in his rooms. His landlady, or laundress, whichever it was, would be shocked and a good thing, too. His character was altogether too immaculate, and a picturesque smudge or so would improve it in the eyes of men. Alice had all the sweet, headlong depravity of mind of the excessively innocent. Using her tortoise-shell pins-ness, she read the name of Everard Jenkins printed on the wall on the right-hand side of the open door of number 82, and, plunging into the dimness, began to ascend. She met a man on the first landing who looked like a doctor. He seemed in a hurry to get to his hansom, which she had observed standing there. He merely peered in her face and passed on before she could ask him if he was the doctor, and if so, how Mr. Jenkins was. She went on ascending till she found the right door, knocked, and stood there breathless. A foolish fear assailed her as she waited. She found herself dreading the first sight of Everard as he would appear on opening the door to her. She remembered with annoyance the poor, lank, gawky face, which always made her think, as she used to tell her mother, of a boy's compendious clasp-knife, with all the blades open. He would smile, of course, and look pleased to see her. It was a strong step for haughty Alice Damer, whom he had sighed for so long, to visit a man in his rooms at half-past eleven, and ask him to marry her. He was a long time coming. She rang again more firmly. The door was opened by a nurse. Everard had not been raving then. He was probably in bed, and she formally muttered his name. The nurse seemed to have been expecting her, murmuring, "'You would like to see him, ma'am?' She led the way into the sitting-room, out of which the bedroom obviously opened. The door was ajar. The nurse did not stop. "'But not in there!' Alice stammered. A strong note of disapprobation pierced in the woman's voice as she turned round sharply. "'Why not? He's dead. You're not going to faint?' "'Oh, no,' said the poor girl, striving to adjust herself to these new and unexpected circumstances. Like a proud, plucky automaton, she entered the bedroom, and looked on the form that was faintly outlined under the sheet, so thin Everard had grown. She had good nerves, and could always bear shocks well, but an immense searching pity, a world of value for the dead man, combined with self-depreciation, filled her, and she wept silently. Her noble calmness and self-restraint won the admiration of the nurse, who had been condemning the heartless creature wholesale for having left her sweetheart to die alone as she had done. "'What was it, nurse?' she asked. "'Double pneumonia. Collapse. I telegraphed to you, Miss... You are Miss Damer, I believe.' He objected, but once he became unable to speak, I took it upon myself. I thought you would want to be here. "'Of course. But I have only just got it.' The nurse accepted the amende. She could not realize that Alice was struggling to form a comment on the apparent inconsistency of a man sick unto death being able to dine with her, hoping at the same time that dates would be proved not to fit, and all be normally explained. She stammered something vague as the nurse laid down the covering sheet and disclosed the still face, 
looking, however, no more emaciated than Alice had seen it in life, and no longer ago than last night. Alice was painfully aware of the tacit suggestion on the woman's part that she should bend down and kiss that waxen mask, and recoiled, though the nurse had said no word. "'Oh, I can't kiss anybody dead. It's awful of me, nurse, but I can't.' "'Some can't,' said the nurse resignedly. "'And this girl was the poor gentleman's fiancée, so she had understood.' She was a little pacified when Alice unfastened the bunch of lilies of the valley that she was wearing, and laid them on the dead man's breast. Then she turned away and dried her eyes. She was a beautiful creature, the nurse thought, and was conscious that the faulty young lady was slowly acquiring her sympathies. "'When did he die? When was it?' "'We don't know exactly, miss, in these cases. But he last spoke about seven. "'What made you think of sending to me?' "'Because, miss, for days before, when he was wandering worst, he talked about you. "'We gathered, the doctor and I, that he was more or less engaged to you, miss, "'but that you was rather too fond of putting him off. "'Said it had been going on for years, and that he was fairly worn out. "'So he was, poor man. He hadn't an ounce of flesh on his bones to spare.' "'Yes, but—' the girl exclaimed impatiently i want to get at the facts he died you say this morning at seven o'clock spoke last at seven o'clock last night miss i said died some time in the night or may be directly after he did speak at least part of him may have died as ignorant people seem to think he was hardly breathing at a little before eight but the last spark may have been held on longer "'I suppose you know, nurse, that he dined with me last night at a quarter past eight, said the girl stonily, looking away from the nurse's apathetic face, which changed at once sympathetically. "'Miss, you're upset. You took it so calm at first. Have some brandy. You have had a shock. One understands.' "'He dined with me,' Alice repeated obstinately. The nurse stared at her and shrugged her shoulders. Poor girl, she was evidently one of the outwardly quiet ones, who smother the symptoms of disturbance, only to feel the shock more keenly. People take these things in such a variety of ways. The idea of the dinner party had got fixed in her mind by the shock. She was unable now to let go of the idea of Everard's keeping his engagement with her. She had received the telegram all right, of course. There could be no doubt of it and some domestic reason had prevented her from responding to the summons, or possibly that same backwardness which had affected the smooth course of the engagement had been at work. She hadn't cared for him much, though she had been persuaded into giving her word. In an even tone calculated to restore the shattered nerves of the shaken girl, the nurse remarked, "'Mr. Jenkins' sister-in-law, the one that lives in France, will be here presently, to see about the funeral arrangements. He wanted you to have all his old china and books, miss, he used to say so, and doubtless that will be done.' But Alice Damer had gone resolutely across to the bed, from which the two, in the course of conversation, had unconsciously deviated. She dexterously turned down the sheet, and, stooping, performed the rite of love, the little act of devotion which she had refused him just before. What was she saying? Mrs. Clarkson observed closely what she considered one of the curiosities of mental stress. I kissed him last night when he came to me. So you see, whether I liked it or not, I did kiss a dead man. And it's no use minding now, is it? She kissed him repeatedly, with a pale semblance of passion. The nurse took her arm gently, and led her away from the bed, and she submitted to be placed in a chair. "'Miss, now you've done that, you'll feel better. I should go home if I were you. Take that hansom outside. It's the one you came in, perhaps, and you haven't paid him?' Alice signified a negative to this, helplessly, but allowed the nurse to pin her veil on for her. It hid her tear-stained face a little. Then the good woman led her downstairs and out on to the pavement. Sure enough, there was a hansom waiting there, and the nurse hailed the driver. 
Gruffly he turned round and stared at them. "'And I say,' he appeared to be remarking, "'and I say, who's going to pay me my fare?' "'Why, the lady will, of course. Get in, miss. I'll hold your dress away from the wheel.' But the cabman was not satisfied, nor did he address himself to the task of resuming his drooping reins. He seemed to have had a shock, too. "'No, I didn't mean her. Who's going to pay me three bob for last night, and for Waitnear?' "'That's no affair of ours,' replied the nurse cheerfully. "'You must take the lady. Where to, shall I say, miss?' Alice, crouching inside, mumbled the address of her home. The cabman swore. "'No, I'm damned. You get out. I ain't a-going near that blasted house again for nobody. Took a fare from there last night, I did, and drove em here, and here I may stop till doomsday, I suppose, before I see a shillin' of his money. Tain't right.' He was obviously drunk, but not dangerous, so the nurse thought. "'Come, come,' she expostulated. Alice, frightened, prepared to get out. "'Oh, what's the matter?' she moaned. "'Matter!' matters this i drove him here right enough and pulls up where he told me and my gentleman doesn't get out seems as if he was a-goin to make a night of it in my cab drunk i says to myself and i opens the trap meanin to take my fare and clear him out but lord bless me why there wasn't no one there he'd got out of course said mrs clarkson while you weren't looking bilked says i and thinks i i'll just come and wait here till i sees my gentleman come down those stairs again you'll never see him come downstairs again said the nurse with a flash of inspiration except in his coffin come get on take the lady where she wants to go she thought of it all afterwards but then nurses see such queer things she had taken the cabman's number end of section two Section three of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Operation, Part One. Yes, I think that might hang a day longer. I can finish up the mints for my lunch, and you must do something with the turkey legs for dinner. Let me see, and there's fish today, and then, well, suppose you make a savory. Master don't care for savories, ma'am. A sweet, then, I don't care and that's all i think mrs jo mardell in her neat morning shirt coquettishly finished with a man-like tie and the severity of her attire much modified by the bows and loops of waved hair that crowned her head turned and was about to leave the dark basement of the little house in kiramir street west kensington when a door in the upper regions banged there he's off and i wanted a check mrs mardell observed with mild irritation she glanced at the kitchen clock with a degree of confidence she did not place in the elegant timekeeper cased in jewels that hung on the front of her shirt. "'Why, it's only half-past ten. "'Master's early gone this morning,' said the cook. "'Gladys took his breakfast up only ten minutes ago.' She paused, then summoning her courage, she asked, "'Ma'am, are people usually buried on Christmas Day?' "'Why, you silly woman, it depends on what day they die. "'Who's been dying?' "'I'll swear,' said the woman eagerly, "'that I saw a corpse being carried down the steps of number 13 "'just over the street opposite nearly a week ago, "'and I reckon it back Christmas Day. "'It's been worrying me ever since. "'Yes, I saw the mourners and hearse and feathers and all done quite proper. "'I was looking out of the front staircase window. "'Neglecting your work, Vance? Serves you right. "'You saw Whiteley's sail-cart, perhaps.' You were looking sideways through the red panes, and glass, you know, refracts oddly. Who lives at number thirteen? Oddly enough, mum, I don't know, though I mostly could tell you the names of everybody in the street. I might ask one of the tradespeople, should I? Yes, do, if you like. Brr! She shivered affectedly, strong in the pride of her health and good looks. It seems a cold time to choose to be put into the ground. One would sooner be cremated this weather. Holding up her crisp, befrilled skirts, the second wife of Joseph Mardell, the popular comic actor, who
who was just now drawing crowds to his Christmas extravaganza at the quality, made her way up from the dark basement to the abodes of light above. Noiselessly she let fall behind her that swing door at the top of the staircase, which effectively divided the world of society from its service, and exchanged stone and oilcloth for soft carpets and silken curtains. It was a very pretty little house, her house. She admitted Joe into it, her husband-lover Joe. She had managed to keep him her lover. All wives should. She glanced as she passed by at the hat-stand in the hall. Joe had stupidly gone without his fur coat, though it was freezing. Or was it that it needed a stitch? How careless of Gladys! He had left his big umbrella, too, for there it bulged in the rack, beside her own delicate silver-topped one. Careless Joe! willing enough to ignore the mere physical claims of the self he morally bowed to. Moreover, he forced everyone else to do so likewise. He must have his own way, and brooked no check where his mental desires were concerned. It was perhaps the secret of his sway over men and women. She thought of him, Joseph Mardell, the greatly sought after, and hers, with complacent affection, glancing up conscientiously at the branch of mistletoe which was entwined with the square glass lamp that hung over the front door. Joe had passionately kissed her under the mystic bough a week ago, for luck on the first night of the successful peace. And luck had come, and seemingly remained with them. The booking was splendid, and they were rehearsing a more serious play that was to follow the Christmas jollity. Joe was so busy he didn't know where to turn for a spare five minutes. She did not complain, for if things went on like this, they would be able to move out of West Kensington, where you couldn't get a smart parlour-maid to stop with you. Gladys and her fingernails was a sore trial. She entered the dining-room, and her eyes sought the sideboard. Ah, Joe had had some sense, after all, and had remembered to refresh the inner man before leaving as the violated tantalus betokened. He lay in bed late, he rarely breakfasted, and never with her. She rose at eight, on principle. She could not afford to keep actors hours and ruin her complexion. She stood pensively by the small piece of Sheraton furniture, before she opened a drawer and took out of it what she had come to seek. Last night's oranges and apples beamed there on a pretty dish. Joe's cigarette boxes flung about needed tidying up. The presentation silver bowl given to Joe by his fellow actors on the occasion of his first marriage shone in the centre with dignified lustre. They had chosen something quite different to present to him as a memento of his second venture. That was in her room right now. The bowl had a dwarf fern in it now, but sometimes it ran over with punch, or was packed with roses. Another use was contemplated for it. If Joe and she were to have a baby, which, sadly enough, did not seem likely, the bowl would be used for the christening. Mrs. Bardell took a pretty little checker duster out of a drawer and went upstairs to her drawing-room on the first floor. She carefully picked up an iridescent bead off the carpet, the spoil of the dress she had worn last night, and placed it on an ash-tray. She then proceeded to rub up the several minute objects on her silver table, wishing heartily that she could afford to have them lacquered, and thus dispense with her daily task. So occupied she looked wholly pretty and half-domestic, a little sobrettish, like those neat-aproned maids who flutter early about a stage scene, and usher in and lay the tables for tragedy. There was no harm in Florence Mardell. She was a smart, novel-reading, Sandown and Ranelagh going woman, easily dressed, easily amused, a little detached perhaps in her interests, and careless of the more serious issues of life, but quite willing to simulate and assume social crazes as they came up. She played a good game of bridge, she glanced at the deep reviews as well as the Windsor and Pearson's, and improved her mind on the slightest opportunity. You could always get her for a subscription lecture of sorts, and she quite approved of female suffrage, without, however, actively concerning herself in its propaganda. She never fagged. She was always beautifully dressed in a severish, strapped, mock-manly style, and could wear successfully the very largest hats when they came in. 
she had been the widow of an officer and had lived at wimbledon in a big dull house standing in its own grounds she had first set eyes on joe mardell playing a strong macheath in the beggar's opera to the most ineffective polly peachum of julia fitzgerald miss fitzgerald was his wife had she but known it it might have made a difference but very likely it would not have then and there she had fallen in love with the actor across the footlights impulsively violently madly and she had not rested being of an acquisitive pugnacious predatory habit of mind until she had persuaded a journalistic friend of hers and his to bring about an introduction with her effective crown of real golden hair waved and curled in extremis her clean fresh suburbanity she had fascinated macheath he was known to be weak volage and full of moods florence was on the contrary strong and pertinacious she had taken him in a mood and let her love profit by it with fond remorselessness she had driven him to drive his wife to divorce him all this she had compassed in her own calm detached way as if unconscious of the larger issues she was stirring another woman's happiness a man's honour and an actor's art for joe was a genius and recognised to be one in spite of some people said because of his strange limitations a little man almost a dwarf he could play the burly falstaff and the courtly byron he could write articles in the reviews he could hold supper-tables in a roar julia mardell's happiness had been sacrificed for she adored and was known to adore her husband to oblige him she had condescended to make use of some of the more complicated and recondite cogs of the machinery of the english law of divorce and had tamely surrendered without humiliating him one of the most fascinating men of the day to another woman yet julia was quite as good-looking as florence if in a different style she was the full-souled full-breasted large-eyed junoesque female type and only undertook the playing of a minx like polly peachum to suit joe such a majestic walk as hers such dark swimming eyes were of no avail to the actress who aspired to play one of the wayward mistresses of the highwayman it was the measure of Julia's love and her power of self-abnegation. Joe was prepared to take the whole play on his shoulders, only he must have a sympathetic woman to act with. He did find Julia sympathetic in those days when he loved her, and before the pretty widow from Wimbledon had leaned out of her box and shaken her golden locks at him. Then one day the two women met. Matters were arranged. Joe, susceptible, weak, hustled and busy succumbed lawyers acted for him julia was compliant florence keen joe worked on and was divorced while rehearsing a new play he himself never knew how it all happened there was a large signed photograph of julia in joe's study now standing unframed concave and dusty on the mantelpiece Joe had not dared or cared to give it a more polite or permanent abiding place. Indeed, Florence had had some thoughts of removing it from its even so humble position. Her friends wondered how she could possibly bear to have it there for Joe to see every day. But she was capricious. One never knew how she would take things. It was their expressed opinion which perhaps induced her to let it stay, curled up, and drooping slavishly as time went on and the dust and heat of the fire brought its proud head low florence bore julia no grudge she should think not indeed julia had been very good about it had made no difficulties but on the contrary had smoothed and made easy the path of divorce for the man she loved that is if she really did care for joe she had been so terribly callous in her interviews so full of zeal to give him his freedom it was hardly human so the woman who had profited by her action thought and certainly not very womanly florence could not imagine herself allowing a cold business-like lawyer to dictate her a letter bidding joe come back to her herewith a summons intended of course for ultimate publication 
it disgusted florence this horrible business of suing for restitution of conjugal rights julia's formal petition was refused by joe in another cold letter equally intended for publication florence had actually read the two inhuman missives printed together in the daily paper divorce had followed in due course oh you tamely died yes little frivolous florence who had never read tennyson would have taken the advice of the egyptian and would have clung to fulvia's waist and thrust the dagger through her side she was a true woman like cleopatra and knew that the elemental passions once raised must have full mastery a man all to oneself or nothing that was her philosophy the feelings of the man in question the state of his affections no matter florence did not see herself considering them or taking any deadly sex insult lying down she considered that julia's poor spiritedness did really verge on meanness she had accepted money from joe an allowance to enable her to leave the stage report said that she had grown stout report said that she had taken to drink lies probably so generous florence said nobody in florence's world knew anything about julia excepting miss walton who had introduced them and though the two women had continued their intimacy it was with the tacit agreement that the name of julia should not be mentioned between them there were plenty of other subjects to talk about miss walton was like everybody else more than half in love with joe funny how they all were rather nice for joe's wife since joe did not bother with any of them mrs mardell after having polished the silver diligently turned her attention to the room she ordered the chairs according to some abstruse social system of her own and flicked her duster about freely here and there she did not feel very fit rather queer on the contrary all overish she could not have told you what it was but she was mysteriously conscious of something excessive something outrageous like severe pain in wait for her she seemed to apprehend its nearness instinctively as a patient seated in the dentist's chair watches the eminent practitioner's feet moving and is aware in all his sensitive enamel of the imminent grinding of the file that has been set going perhaps it was the long-continued strain of the cold that was affecting her the frost had lasted since before christmas and had been very severe she paused the little clock on the mantelpiece tinkled half-past eleven supposing she were to give herself a slight moral fillip go upstairs and try on her new dress and see how it fitted after having been back twice she was sure in this way to obtain a sensation pleasurable or otherwise she mounted another flight feeling every step to be an effort she lit the gas stove in her room and dismissed the dilatory housemaid whom she found on her knees examining the pattern of the carpet then she dragged a tall cheval glass into position having due regards to unbecoming cross lights and undressed her white handsome shoulders appeared she looked ten times prettier than she had done in the severe morning shirt and tie and she knew it she stood for a few minutes before the mirror complacently admiring herself and in no hurry to don the heavily trimmed corsage that awaited her verdict it lay beside her half in and half out of the flowered cardboard box interleaved with tissue paper and with intersecting lines of tape winding it into its cage her eyes rested on it with feminine appreciation of the elaborate building of the silk lining with its white bone cases crossing and recrossing the back of it and the high collar which was to fit in under the very lobe of the ear still she deferred the pleasing moment of assumption standing still and preening herself soft lappets of valenciennes lace flowering out as a frame to the pink skin suddenly taken by surprise without a cry or a moan she cowered and was bent bent nearly double agonizing pangs shot through the framework of her body her eyes were glassed over with tears and through them she stared out at the world bewildered peering to see from which point the next arrow of dolor would come 
it came again without fail it came again this time no stabbing thrust but a sword driving delving laboriously through her vitals in a lingering painstaking manner she was by now prepared and well frightened and she groaned aloud her breasts rose and came together as in some strange health exercise under the laces and ribbons my god was it was the silver bowl downstairs going to be used at last no it could not be the thought was dismissed as soon as it formed a chill on the liver the extreme cold what a fool she was to prance about like a peacock in front of a glass for half an hour half dressed what else could she expect that silly stove gave no heat she gathered to her a dressing-gown that lay near and sat still cowering a long pause she could not think but she received no physical intimation of the recurrence of her agony five minutes later she boldly rose defying it and tore the new dress out of its rustling ward without stopping to untie the tapes that controlled it with a screech of tissue paper it yielded into her hands and she put it on then she laughed the pain was forgotten she wriggled about happily yes it still catches me just there they must have it back i'll go to madame about it on let me see tuesday taking the precaution of putting her arms properly into the warm dressing jacket this time she wrapped the dress up again tied the white tapes across it put the lid on firmly and with the little stylograph joe had given her methodically scored out her own name from the label thus substituting that of the dressmaker printed all over the box the exertion slight as it was roused again the smouldering fire of pain she sat down helplessly on her bed giving herself up to it her eyes were like those of a dumb animal in a death anguish as she stared across at her reflection of her already distorted features in the glass rolling to and fro she grasped and relaxed alternately the fronts of her peignoir knotted feverishly in her palm what the devil is it she murmured i feel as if my life was going she did not think of calling any one vance or gladys the impotent housemaid no one could help her she was but a poor human passageway for these relentless throes that passed juggernaut-like through her shrinking body it was like a garden roller when it was not like many scythes set on one axle turning twisting inside her what had she ever done to suffer so no child of joe's could be so cruel and tear its mother thus nay she had not conceived unless it was some monstrous impious growth that was rending her and would not soften or relax till it killed her she really thought she was going to die presently when all was quiet again in the tortured battleground of her body she rose and pushed her hand through her bows of wavy hair and flung it back hideously and crossed the room apologetically almost for fear of provoking a recurrence of the horror she dragged herself downstairs and to the swing door at the head of the kitchen stairs she now felt the need of a confidant she must tell someone the housemaid was too young vance was fairly motherly pushing open the door she sat down on the top step with her peignoir gathered round her and stretching out her legs allowed them to hang over into the dark abyss of vance's domain by the time she felt able to raise her voice and call vance she had decided not to confide in her the cook would immediately think things and she wanted no fuss it was not that either she only wished it was for then there would at least be some compensation in baby fingers to smooth pain away in response to her weak summons the cook appeared at the foot of the stairs even in the dim penumbra of a london basement a person unpreoccupied by her own symptoms would have realized at once that vance was discomposed agitated in some unusual way her cap was hanging by one hairpin her flowery arms were nervously rubbing one against the other but mrs mardell noticed nothing in other people to-day she addressed vance slowly and deliberately vance please i want you to make me a nice cup of tea at once i shall not be able to eat any lunch 
I think I'll wait till six and have something with Mr. Mardell. Ain't you feeling well, Mum? asked the cook spiritlessly. No, not very. A little all overish. It will be nothing, only I don't feel like eating a solid meal. Nor I can't say I feel like cooking it, Vance observed bitterly. I'm that upset. I've been across and asked. Asked what? inquired Mrs. Mardell warily. About the funeral that I saw with my own eyes leaving that house on Christmas Day. It's not natural, I said, to go getting buried on Christmas Day. Mrs. Mardell interposed patiently. You don't mean to say you went and asked at the house if they'd had anyone die there? Really, Vance. It's no good saying that now, Mum. I had to know. And it's only a nursing home, not a private house, so I've done no harm. And, the woman's voice grew low and hoarse, nobody ain't died there. Not yet, that's all. She put her apron to her face. Good gracious, Vance, Mrs. Mardell cried. Tell me more about it. Mom, they've only got one patient there, a lady. She was going on all right, but she had a relapse this morning, just about half past eleven, their cook said it was. She had an operation three weeks ago, and no good, and it's got to be done all over again this afternoon at two o'clock, and they can't tell as it'll be successful this time. Well, my good woman, don't you worry. Let's hope that the lady will get over it. People do, you know, or there would be an end of nursing homes. I really feel so poorly myself that I can't get up much sympathy with other people's aches and pains. Be quick and put the kettle on. Or is it boiling already? Yes, Mum, you shall have it in a minute. Mum, you may not believe me, but I seen a proper funeral, and the hearse waiting, and the corpse carried out and down those steps, and the bearers with crape on their hats and so attentive, and one of them was no bigger than Master. I thought of Master the moment I saw him, and she was a big woman, for she took a big coffin. You are settling that it's the woman who's lying ill there now who has got to die, I see. What's her name? I asked, but the girl didn't know, only that she was an actress. Mrs. Mardell gathered in her legs decisively. Come now, Vance, don't stand there gossiping and unhinging yourself with fancies. Get me my cup of tea. I shall be all right, I expect, when once I have had something warm. Bring it to my room. I shall lie down a bit, I think. She rose to her feet, closed the swing door, dismissing Vance and her dreary, soothsaying vision, and passed upstairs. Her day was spoilt. The pain did not seem to be going to recur, luckily, but the deadly feeling of uneasiness which had succeeded it certainly increased. Her legs were weak and could hardly carry her. People who have seen an apparition are said to feel just so. But as she reflected, it was Vance, not she, who had seen the ghost. She paused halfway up the stairs to look out of the window on the first landing, whence Vance declared she had watched the lugubrious tableau. Mrs. Mardell had never gone in for knowing her neighbours. It was wiser not, or else she would have been aware of the industry that was carried on at number 13. A red brick sham artistic villa, just like her own house, like every other house in the street. She could only make it out by pressing her face against the window, and then she only saw it aslant and red through the vicious stained glass that occupied that particular pane. Eight steps led up to the front door of it, as eight steps led up to hers. Surely it was awkward for the incoming patients, many of them presumably too ill to walk. She wondered what sort of cases they took there. It would depend... Julia, she had heard, had grown very fat, at thirty. That indicated something abnormal in a youngish woman, something that had to be removed generally, she laughed. She wondered why she laughed. "'Your tea, Mum,' said Vance, suddenly, at her elbow. "'I thought I would bring it up to you myself.' Mrs. Mardell was a little ashamed that Vance should discover her staring out of the window at the scene of her absurd cock-and-bull story. She turned and coldly bade the cook precede her to her bedroom with the tea. Vance accepted the rebuff meekly. She looked cowed and thoroughly upset, and as if no merely domestic trifle could affect her now, broken to tragic issues as she had been. 
the tea as mrs mardell had expected revived her and enabled her to lay a nice little plan for a quiet afternoon indoors she proposed to telephone for miss walton to come and sit with her for a bit she needed something or somebody to pick her up of course there was charlie bligh a nice boy whom both she and joe liked she might telephone him to come and take her out to dine as he often did but no she wasn't looking carlton form it wouldn't be fair to charlie to ask him to take out anything that wasn't gay and smart besides it would be rather mean to leave joe to eat his dinner all alone when she had not even said good morning to him she had often left him for dinner of course and he had never thought of objecting verbally at least but just now that he was so busy and overworked she felt sure that he would like her sitting beside him at his dinner even though she could eat nothing she saw herself delicately invalidish in her soft draperies picking at some grapes she felt mysteriously drawn to joe dear joe who was working for her now who never attempted to control her social movements who took what she gave him and was always as ready to flirt with her as if he were not married to her she had managed joe so well no she wouldn't leave joe to-night but get miss walton who would surely stay with her till joe returned about half-past five as usual miss walton over the telephone signified her willingness to come and have a good chat mrs mardell made up her mind to take things easy she was really unwell she had eaten nothing since breakfast she felt empty shaken swelled and sore she could not have got her exquisitely adjusted corsets on if she had tried or endured the pressure of them round her body a tea-gown was clearly indicated she assumed one and a little lace cap that went well with it sighing deeply she lay down on the rose-coloured chintz sofa in the drawing-room shaded by a soft standard lamp breathing timorously existing furtively unnoticed she hoped it would pass her by this brooding eagle of pain waiting to tear her she had brought her jewel-case downstairs with her and idly toyed with her trinkets there were three trays lined with velvet they twinkled with precious stones she took every piece in order and examined them slowly seriously all the while her fingers seemed to know that down at the bottom of the box lay their real objective a thin crumpled tousled letter folded small and turning up at the corners florence mardell had received it a few days after her marriage and although it was only a letter from a woman had forborne to show it to her husband the letter was not actually malicious or even disagreeable but it had dismayed her and shocked her she had kept it in case julia should ever choose to lay aside her extraordinary tolerance and become human again she read it over now to remind her of what it contained indeed she had intended to do so when she fetched the box the by-play with the jewellery was only a blind self-deceiving a sop to her superficial consciousness now it is all over my strivings have not been in vain and joe passes from me to you you must not mind my writing you florence i think that on the whole you will prefer to know what i feel and that the woman you have supplanted is not your enemy joe loves you and as the woman joe loves you cannot be abhorrent to me convention forbids me to be your personal friend your feeling possibly and perhaps my own for i am but a woman after all and the open wound that was left in my life when joe was torn from my side would be chafed and kept raw by the sight of him merged now in your life yes it is better so i cannot will not see him either though joe is not conventional joe is nothing that is not splendid i did i do love him so passionately that i cannot hate you florence as you see you are the fair new temple in which he worships the spirit of beauty and love and life the law has clanged the door too none may dare to interrupt the litany he prays there on his knees god bless you but oh my dear keep him there never undress the altar no more shifting for joe if we women can help it he is a great man he must be treated like a great man these upheavals are bad for him from every point of view so be practical as well as passionate and condescend to learn from me who failed 
how not to lose him only approximately can you learn for the wind of art blows its children where it listeth you know what an artist he is and all artists are nothing but divine children but florence on your life don't treat him as one don't let yourself mother him as i did and be mad enough to sink the mistress in the sister the friend even that was my fatal mistake i abstracted my sexual self till i became at last the caterer for his mere physical welfare the confidant of his passing flirtations oh the bitterness of those smothered confessions those despairing returns of him broken marred and dispirited to the one who surely loved him do this my dear as i did and then one day he'll come to you as he came to me and put his head on your knee and ask you to divorce him so you're both ruined in your several ways he cannot go through it a second time now listen you must i know i would have you always a little inaccessible puzzling capricious even i would ask you to dare to appear selfish if you can manage it preserve your delicate tangibility punish any slight infringement of your rules close your door to him at night when he has been naughty or careless what it will cost you but it is the right way you have an enormous pull by not acting with him believe me one gets so common so cheap to a man when he is used to knocking one about all over the stage as catherine say or insulting one as nancy stay away from the theatre and accept as many dinners without him as you can although there isn't the very slightest chance of his losing you don't let him feel as convinced of that as you are yourself you see what i mean don't you florence i heard you were very clever as well as a little frivolous i have thought all this out in many sleepless nights for your benefit and his yes it is joe that i am thinking of and shall think of till i die and so of you too oh don't for goodness sake be offended by this letter or take a dislike to me for whether you like it or not you will never be quite free of me any more thought strong thought does permeate matter and finds itself able to overthrow its mere material resistance i have proved it no matter how i won't weary you with attempted explanations i should not fancy you were psychic but be sure that there will be a little of me in all your relations with joe i shall have a word in your menage and you must not let the thought of it make you uncomfortable do you suppose i could have let him go so easily if i had not this power to console me take it as the slight penalty of kidnapping a man out of the ward of a devoted woman you see how it is he comes away she offers no material or spirited opposition but he brings inevitably some of her atmosphere along with him joe never actually ceased to love me he only began to love you i never misconducted myself funny phrase so i am still his true and faithful wife bone of his bone flesh of his flesh and where he is henceforth in some sort i am it cannot be helped it is a good thing that i am not vindictive and that i don't hate you since our relation must necessarily be so close i assure you that it will not inconvenience you annoy you or trouble you at all at least not until the bands of the spirit are loosed in one of these great bare soul-stripped unaccounted for moments of life that come to all of us sometimes then you know one can't tell or foresee the spiritual bonds and relationships assert themselves and enforce attention i can't quite promise to shield you then to free you from the circle of the charm but are you so frivolous florence won't it interest you awe you soothe you ah don't fear me don't hate me bid your flesh comply with me i am only the ghost of a wife a power of love that can't circumscribe itself even though it would there is a physical lean between us undoubtedly i won't drag it if i can help i'll try to control i don't know what i am writing 
something writes for me but trust me julia what a cat said mrs mardell she folded up the letter again and laid it at the bottom of the box it was almost actionable she thought a threatening letter or else the letter of a mad spiritualist utter sentiment impossible rot what would charlie bligh or any other daylight person think of it strangely enough she had more or less taken julia's advice it was sensible and thus she supposed germane to her own character she had not mothered joe what woman in her senses would she needed no deserted defeated schemer to hang about her in the spirit to tell her that she knew men as julia with all her preachments had evidently never known them and the result of her wise treatment of joe was that he was devoted to her extraordinarily so for a busy man of course he worked hard too hard harder than he had done in julia's time it had happened so success had brought its own tension and high pressure he was not as julia and her friends might like to suggest trying to drown the memory of her in a round of forced activities he was only taking fortune at the flood and making dramatic hay while the sun of critics favour shone not for a moment did he regret the step he had taken his was an essentially light nature he never brooded and he detested heroics the writer of that letter with its tedious mixture of sentimentality and preoccupation with material cares must have bored joe to death in the days when she had him all to herself and could claim consecutive opportunity for worrying him and now of course a masterpiece of supreme tactlessness like all failures she turned critic and took on herself to give good advice florence mardell laughed the reading of the letter had acted as even a better philip than the trying on of the dress and had nearly made her angry i suppose she tossed her little crowned head that it is very good of her to give me the straight tip and volunteer to overlook my menage generally like a sort of superior lady housekeeper i am not so bad at it myself thank you she worked herself up to a sneer much obliged julia i'm sure for haunting me especially as she appears willing to confine herself merely to bothering the sensible mistress of the house and doesn't go frightening the servants and making them give up their places vance wouldn't stop a minute her brow furrowed a little as she remembered the white frightened face of vance that morning it's a fairly cool thing though her thought resumed for one woman to tell another flat that she considers herself part of her because she happens to have adored her husband and does still i suppose man and wife no wife and wife are one flesh ha ha it was two o'clock her face changed arrowy tinglings growlings as of a chained monster inside her slender frame punctuated her words the pain had come again when miss walton came in she would ask her to ring up a doctor she could not have dragged herself to the instrument now End of section 3